One of the worst ways to die is from a disease called glioblastoma. And I'm going to explain to you why. So I know this may sound scary, but from my experience, the more we learn about specific diseases, the better we can prepare ourselves and the less we will fear them. It's hard to talk about because it's hard for me to sit here and tell you that it will suck to die from this disease. It's hard. You're usually young and you usually have a lot of symptoms and that's hard to admit to people. And I think because it's hard to admit to people, people don't. We just don't talk about it. And then the people who are going through it are um, surprised and traumatized by everything that they have to go through and then the family members who have to witness it. A lot of times people find my videos after the fact, after they've gone through it and they wish they would have seen this before. So I hope you will take the time to see this now before you are experiencing it or while you're going through it so you can educate yourself and hopefully live better and die better. I'm going to describe to you what this disease actually is, the symptoms that come along with it usually, and then how we as healthcare workers can manage those symptoms and help you. So glioblastoma is basically a tumor in the brain, cancer that attacks the glial cells in the brain and it creates tumors. The symptoms will vary depending on the tumor size and where it is located. Again, I mostly on hospice see it in men, but it does affect women as well. And it's usually young men and women, 20s, 30s, 40s. So this disease is usually aggressive and hard to treat. And by the time I see them on hospice, this person has already done one or two surgeries, many rounds of chemo and radiation. In general, in my opinion, patients with this disease come on hospice too late. Because they are young and because they have this mentality of fighting it, and not that they shouldn't fight it, I, I understand that. But I think if they fully understood the, the usual progression of this disease from the beginning, they may have a different outlook and might choose hospice a little earlier. So statistics show that the five year survival rate for this disease is only about 7%. And the average uh, life expectancy is around eight months. So the way I try to tell people to look at it is if you know that you are likely going to die within a year, maybe two if you're lucky, I suppose maybe five if you're in that 7%, which I hope everyone is, right? I, I don't want to be the nurse of doom and gloom, but what I want you to do is try to reframe your brain around what you want your life to look like. If you knew you only had eight months to a year left, how do you want that to look? Do you want to be in and out of doctor's appointments, in and out of hospital stays, in and out of treatments that are going to make you feel sick and worse? Or are you going to want to reframe your life and try to spend those last few months with your family, with your friends? And it's truly up to you. Either way, I want you to do what you want, but I just want to throw the other option out there because I think many times people don't know about the other option, which is to come on hospice and die peacefully in your home with family and friends. And this is not me in any way trying to push you onto hospice or push anyone onto hospice. It's just the idea of thinking about uh, a different way, breaking the taboo of hospice, breaking the taboo of, of death, right? I think if, if we know this disease is terminal, kind of no matter what, how do you want the rest of your life to look? And if it is the other way, that's okay too. But I just think people need to know that there's other options out there. And I think to educate yourself about this disease progression specifically, you'll be able to make a better choice for what you want. I do think some of the surgeries and chemos and, and radiation can approve your quality of life. So by all means, if that is the case, I would always recommend those things. There's just always a time and place for those things to eventually stop. And that is the point of the video, to learn all the things you can learn about this and then you can make a better educated choice. So here are the main symptoms. The number one symptom we see um, the most is headaches. And these are severe and persistent. So they usually happen uh, in the mornings or when someone starts laying down. They are treatable, but it's just the main symptom of the disease because there's a brain tumor in the brain. So why does this happen? This happens usually because, uh, or one of the reasons I should say, is because of inflammation in the brain. It causes headaches. The tumor causes inflammation, which causes headaches. The second symptom we see with almost everybody are seizures. Sometimes they're mild, sometimes they're not, meaning they can be severe compulsive seizing for a long period of time. I don't say this to scare you, I just say this to let you know 
this is one of the main symptoms. So the third thing we see is cognitive and neurological changes. These usually manifest as uh, speech changes, coordination changes, confusion, disorientation. Someone can act childlike, have personality changes. It depends on the person, where the tumor is, where it's located, but definitely cognitive changes. So the fourth one is vision and hearing changes. Now this can be very troublesome for the person because they can start having double vision. So it's really hard for them to stand up and look at people because they're seeing double. It can make you feel dizzy. It just doesn't feel good. So that is one of the symptoms. And then also ringing in the ears or tinnitus can also happen, which can be disturbing because you just hear constant ringing. So this, these two things do not always happen, but they are a symptom, again, depending on where the tumor is and how big it is. So number five is weakness and numbness. Again, I talked about this person will definitely have a lot of functional issues, meaning hard for, hard for them to walk, hard for them to take care of themselves because they could have numbness in their hands, numbness in their feet. So it's hard for them to do the things that they were normally easily doing. So number six is changes in moods or emotional states. Very often I've seen people with glioblastomas who um, break out in crying fits. So out of nowhere, they seem to be doing okay. And then suddenly they are like bursting into tears and sobbing. And if you ask them what's wrong, they can't tell you and they don't really know why they're doing it. So it's not necessarily an emotional thing. It's like a, it's like a thing that's happening in the brain causing them to be emotional or show um, signs of crying. They also can have changes of personality. They can be moody. They can be irritable. They can have anger outbursts. Again, not everybody, but this, can be possible, just depending on where the tumor is and the size of it. Uh, and number seven, the last one is nausea and vomiting. This seems to be because of a combination of all the other things. So you have double vision, you might be dizzy, you feel confused, um, you're on a lot of medications, which can cause you to feel nauseous, which can cause you to vomit. So um, it doesn't happen with everybody, but it definitely is one of the more frequent symptoms we see. Okay, so here's the good news. The good news is on hospice, we see these patients a lot. We see these symptoms a lot and we know how to aggressively treat them. And we can, there are many, many things we can do to help your quality of life with this disease. So there are tons of different pain medications we can put you on for pain, for headaches. There are a whole different variety of pain medications that work on different parts of your brain to help with different issues. So we can handle that. We also can handle the seizures. There are tons of seizure medications that we can put you on to prevent seizures and they mostly work. So, um, you won't necessarily always be having seizures because we'll be, we'll be putting you on prophylactic medication to help with those. So the inflammation. So in general, you're going to, your body is going to be inflamed. This happens with most cancers. In this particular one, it's in the brain. So we usually put you on medication too, to help with the inflammation, which helps with pain, which helps with energy, which, which helps with basically all of the symptoms. At the end of the day, this disease is just hard in general. So even if all of the symptoms are controlled, we still know it's hard because you're seeing, actually, this is a good thing. I'm gonna say all this stuff, but after I say that stuff, so hold on. Okay. <laughs> okay. And at the end of the day, if we cannot manage your loved one's symptoms, I'm sorry. And at the end of the day, if we can't manage the symptoms, we can always palliatively sedate someone, which basically means we put them on sedation until they eventually die. This is something we do have to do with glioblastoma patients. Sometimes if we can't get their seizures under control or their pain under control, we will palliatively sedate. In general, this is just hard. Even if we have all of your symptoms managed, it's still difficult because you're usually young, you're losing your functional ability or cognitive ability. I mean, our brains do everything. We take for granted all the things our brain does for us. So when it's not functioning right, it's just hard. So we can manage your symptoms the best we can. We can help educate you and support you emotionally during this time as well. And at the end of the day, you just need to always keep open communications with your hospice team and your doctors and your nurses so we can best take care of you and your loved one. So let me know what disease you want me to do next. And don't forget to subscribe to Hospice Nurse Julie for more death and dying information.